Hey guys, uh, my name is Miguel Ortega and this is Tran Ma. Hey. Welcome to our first uh, web stream um, on the making of The Voice in the Hollow, a new film that Tran and I are working on um, entirely in Unreal. So uh, before we start, I guess we wanted to show you guys a little bit about the type of stuff we do. So um, let me just start this up right here. So this is some of the work that we've done in the past. Uh, we, Tran and I come from visual effects. We both teach at Noman School of Visual Effects. Our focus has been primarily like creature monsters and um, I mean, Tran does kind of everything too. But um, a few years ago, we decided to branch off and try to do our own projects, our own films. And we've done a few projects at this point. We've done like three or four short films. We've done a few music videos, a bunch of commercials. And let me just play you guys uh, a reel of some of the stuff we've done together. So let me just click over here, play this here. So even though it says Miguel Ortega, director, I am the director, but everything is done with, with Tran's help. Yeah. Yes. So I would be nothing without Tran. So um, yeah. So those projects that we've done usually have taken us a very long time. And we do most of them in literally our living room. So right here, everything that you just saw was either shot or we did all the visual effects right here. And it's usually a team of two of us. And then if we need riggers, if we need something else, we'll um, which we we always need. We'll bring in some of our friends or some of our um, some people that we've met along the years to help us out. Um, the exciting thing is in the past few years with Unreal, it has now given us. Um, let me put this over here. It has given us the opportunity to um, try to expedite that. So instead of like the Nino took us almost four years to do, we just don't have it in us to spend four years on a short again. Uh, so we try to put a challenge on ourselves. Can we get this done in six months, a short film? And the first thing was like, okay, what are we going to do? And what could we actually get done in Unreal? And the cool thing is we were asked by Noman to come in and show the process uh, as we make this movie in Unreal. So the first thing is we're not Unreal experts by any means. So part of the thing that I think is going to be interesting about this is the journey that we're going through uh, we're more than capable of doing visual effects, but we're basically jumping in on Unreal 
we were part of the Unreal Fellowship, so we have some experience, but by no means uh, experts the way we feel like we are in, you know, V-Ray or, or traditional software. Um, so, so yeah, so you're going to see us stumble a lot, and we're going to document every step along the way. And the goal is to have this done in six months. And it's a very different aesthetic from some of the other things we've done. And we wanted to, I wanted to first start out to show you like what it is that we're doing and where we even um, like what, what our concept is here. So the short is called the voice in the hollow and you'll, you'll see what, it, why we named it that in a second. But um, if you saw all the clips that we just showed, a lot of those are from a short film that we did called the Nino which is a, about a cryptozoologist in the turn of the century. And it's a 28 minute short film. And a lot of the shots took place, take place in a cave. A lot of the cave stuff we shot in our house, but a certain shots, we wanted to shoot it in a real cave and mixed CG and practical stuff so that it gave it a sense of realism. And we went to this cave in Northern uh, California called the Moaning Cave Cavern. And when we were down there, it's a 250 foot drop, I believe. And when we were down there, the lady, the lady that was organizing the, the whole thing, she's like, you know, you could shoot here, 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 here and here, but just don't go over there. And we were like, why can't we go over there? And she's like, oh, because that's where all the dead bodies are. So we were like, wait, what the hell are you talking about? So this is what we found out is that Miguel, they can't, you're not, you're not sharing your screen. I'm going to share it right now. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So luckily I didn't do any slides. So this is the cave that we were shooting uh, all the stuff in. And you could see it's a very tall 250 foot drop uh, from the top to the bottom. And yeah, forgive us while we uh, stumble through some of this stuff. This is our first time doing this. So this is the interior of the cave. And right off to the side here, actually right behind us here is where, where all the bodies were. So what happened is apparently there's, there's an opening at the top of the cave and it's angled in a way overlooking a valley. And whenever the wind would blow in, people would say that they, they constantly hear the moaning cries of a little girl. So people would approach this entrance, this little cave, and it was at the top of like a 10 foot hill. So people thought, oh my God, a little girl fell down this 10 foot hill. Let me help her. And they would slip and fall into this cave, 250 foot drop to the bottom, and they would die. In the turn of the century, they actually excavated this cave. And what they found was a body on top of a body on top of a body on top of a body dozens of bodies, one on top of another. And at the bottom of the, of the pile was the, the skeleton of a 10,000 year old little girl, 10,000 year old skeleton, a uh, little girl. So first of all, that's just crazy because it's, you know, because of the age, but the fact that everybody would say that there was a voice of a little girl calling them. And when they finally excavated the cave, the fact that the oldest skeleton was a, a young girl, Obviously, from a scientific point of view, we know that that's not the reason that there wasn't really a, the ghost of a little girl. But how freaking cool is that? So we were like, we were fascinated by this idea and it stayed in the back of our head. And when we had to come up with another a new idea, we were like, what if we went back and we told the origin story of how that original thing happened? Okay. So let me just go through a few of these things. So Apparently what happened is a, uh, the, the, bo the body of the eldest girl was actually traveling through Russia, from Russia through Alaska, through the Bering Straits and down through North America. And this is basically like what the opening of the cave looks like. So you could see it's just like a little hill. So people would approach it and they would think nothing of it. They would think, oh, it's just 10 feet, not a big deal. I'll just reach in and try to rescue this girl. And again, they didn't know that it was a 250 foot drop. And from, from a scientific point of view, all it really was was essentially like a bottle blowing into the bottle, 250 foot drop being the bottle, and it gave out the sound of a little girl. 
So anyway, this is what the entrance was like. And of course the people would fall 250 foot drop straight to the bottom. And at the bottom, there was like the pile, like I said, so they excavated this turn of the century and that's where they found all the bodies. And you can see all the skulls are cracked to all hell because of the impact of the fall. So, um, so, okay. So we got this story and we thought, okay, that's pretty cool. But what do we do? Just a girl's walking around and she slips and falls into a cave. <laughs> that's not that interesting. So, uh, we wanted to wrap this origin story, which we're completely making up. So this is not, we didn't want to treat this as like, Hey, this is our history channel version of the story. We wanted to tell our story and this is not the moaning cave cavern. This is not that cave, but it's getting the, the wonderment of that story and turning it into our own story and wrapping it around Cain and Abel story, which, um, you know, it's the oldest story second oldest story. Uh, in the Bible. So we thought that this was a, a really cool thing. We originally wanted to do this live action, but it started becoming, we felt like it was going to be too expensive because we wanted it to, to have, you know, paleo Indians or a tribe. And we wanted the tribe to feel big. And then we started looking into like real spears because we wanted the spears to feel like natural, you know, real, um, authentic, authentic, authentic yeah. spears. And everything just started adding up and we're like, okay, we're going to spend the fortune on this. Let's try to find, uh, first of all, a technique that we could do in Unreal. And instead of trying to fight the technology and going for um, complete photorealism, why don't we try to go for a more stylized look? We're going to do it with motion capture, but instead of trying to fight the technology and trying to make it look real and spending months trying to get the eyes refraction to look right, why don't we try to do the opposite? Let's find a style where we don't need subsurface, where we don't even need to have refraction on the eyes, where it would feel charming like a stop motion feel. And we could do certain things to uh, reinforce that style, like push the shallow depth of field a little bit more to make everything feel a little bit smaller. Um, and again, we feel like that would be a, a technique that, or uh, an aesthetic that would fit with the Unreal um, technology limitations. And I don't even know if those are the limitations of Unreal, but I think it's the, the limitations of our skill at, this, at the moment. And, uh, but, but at the same time, I still haven't seen anything in Unreal that, you know, can rival something that's completely photoreal because even, you know, ILM and Weta struggled doing a photoreal human. So we didn't even want to compete against that. Um, Tran is more than capable of doing photorealistic humans if, if she wanted to. But again, once they're animated, it's a completely different ballpark. And this is what we just didn't want to go down this path at all. Okay, so this is some of trans work, and I have some of my work, but I, trans stuff is nicer. <laughs> so I'm just not. showing hers. So, uh, but yeah, so what is that style? So, we're gonna today, we're gonna explore what the aesthetic of the character is, uh, some of the environments, and um, yeah, and then I'll come back and I'll show you guys a few things in a, in a minute. Let me find this. The trans you want to take over here, okay. All right, so let me load up um, some stuff. Now, I usually never show my bad stuff ever. So you will see a lot of bad stuff. Like most of what you'll see coming from me is stuff that I don't think looks good and you probably don't think it looks good. Um, but that's part of the process, right? So for all I know before we're starting, to the, starting this is that uh, we want to go stop motion. So it's stylized and it's not real. And this is like an origin story, right? So it's not advanced civilization. There's no sci-fi, um, or anything. And that's the only parameter I have. Um, and it's, that's really broad. So since it's really broad, it's kind of, well, it's very scary. Um, the, the more open something is, the I just feel like I have no idea what I'm doing. So, uh, you will kind of, you'll see that, right? So um, as far as concepting, uh, we do a lot of 3D. So, you know, I'm just going to try to do it in 3D. But here it is. Okay. So again, you will see a lot of bad stuff. 
and I know it's bad. I don't like showing it, but I think, you know, that's part of the process. So here we are. Um, at first, I didn't know what we're supposed to make. So I just started sculpting heads, and they look a little bit more Asian. Um, right? So this is, this is the stuff we don't like, by the way. Yes, this is yeah. the stuff that I, um, I hate. Uh, let's see. Sorry. Let's go back here. Could, technically speaking, um, they 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 were probably more Asian, the the Paleo Indians that came through California. But again, that's not. We decided to let's do our own thing. Yeah, we yeah. went into a different direction. But here, this is really where it's very broad, and I'm just trying to figure out what is this look. And again, we're trying to do stop motion. Stop motion has a wide range of styles. Um, at the same time, we kind of want to see where we can go. And I, I feel like with these heads, they're all kind of similar. I got stuck, right? And then you can kind of see. Um, and then I just did this really ugly one. <laughs> I'm like, okay, let's back off here. Um, and again, at, at some point, they actually started getting worse like this one. <laughs> that one's super bad. Uh, and then finally, I kind of went, okay, um, here's one that's different. Um, it's not there yet, right? But I'm trying to look for it. And then we kind of went, okay, so we we like this, where this is going. Um, face paint, I don't like. There's a lot of things I don't like, but we're, at least I moved into another direction. So once we kind of were here and thought, let's keep pushing this further. Um, part of the problem I'm having is I don't know you know, I, I like to work with a lot of references. Uh, I don't like to be open so broad. So from, from this point, you know, you can see some of my references. And at first, we, we did explore the, the Asian part, but there's too many difficult parts about this. There's a lot of fur, like, um, in these references, I, and I think they look great. But fur is not something we want to do in Unreal. Um, you can do hair, but again, um, we're very new to it. So there's a lot of there's all kinds of pipeline stuff that you have to to handle or to deal with, right? So we went more in this direction. Okay, so you can see some of my references here, um, and once we can, you know, eliminate the process a bit, um, beginning stages of creating anything, you have to get a lot of bad ideas out, whether you're trying to design something visually or whether you're trying to tell a story, right? So again, that's all the bad stuff. But as you kind of eliminate the things that don't work, um, you're starting to focus in on something. And then once you start to find a focus and direction, you can actually get somewhere, right? So let me just load up some, give me a second, other stages. Right. Okay, so uh, I started trying to color some of these things, and again, there's... Can I interrupt real quick? Yeah. So just one thing that I want to point out is one of the big things we were trying to go for, if you zoom in, like, there's, like, a faceted look to it. We really wanted it to feel, again, well, like like a yeah. carved doll. Yeah, it, we did, but the facets are not really there yet. Yeah. Because I'm still going, well, I don't know what I'm doing. Yeah. Right? So it's like, okay, this is not... We're going for the darker skin. This is totally not working. Uh, and I just keep trying. Let's load up another file. Uh, oops, I think I got jumped too far. Let's go back. Okay, so here's another weird stage. So I start pushing it towards, um, and then here I start, you know, feeling like we're getting a little bit closer. Um, there's still things, right? Before we narrow down, um, I don't think the headdress looks very good. It looks weird. But uh, let's keep loading. That looks the same. Give me another second here. Oh, this is terrible. <laughs> okay. I don't know why her head is all green. Which we thought it was cool to show everything because this is definitely not a linear process. 
it's like one step forward, two steps back most yeah. of the time. So, okay, let me just get jump to that file. All right, here is the final. And this one doesn't have the poly paint, I don't think. Thank you, Heining. Yeah, this doesn't have the poly paint. Okay, so uh, we kind of ended up somewhere with this, with the poly paint version. Uh, I don't like the, the head carving stuff that we put in there. Um, and then once we kind of go, okay, this is sort of giving us look. And then you can see some of the clothing block out. It's really rough. It's stuff I made in Marvelous. So I will jump into Marvelous to show you the obstacles dealing with that. Uh, once we were kind of happy, you know, I went in here and I start sculpting um, facets. You also look at the head. It's, it's pretty asymmetrical. I mean, it's not crazy yeah. asymmetrical, but definitely that's one one thing we want because we wanted to make it feel like a doll, like a doll, yeah. and that it's carved, and you can see that it's been carved, right? And you know, the it's not very realistic form, so that's the look there, and then even the eyes here, right, are sculpted properly just to give some breakup, and then we have the hair. Um, what what I wanted to do in this case that's different is. Uh, we didn't want to do subsurface scattering or like real skin or real hair. Uh, we just want, you know, there's a lot of challenges already in trying to do this. Um, right. So just to kind of narrow this down a little bit. And then, you know, at the same time, trying to make it feel like we're not trying to cheap out, right. Just coming up with a look that we can achieve and that we feel um, that we can get to look good. So this is where I ended up with this character. Yeah, we didn't want it to feel like the subsurface was missing. We wanted to feel like it, not feel like, we wanted it to be a choice that we did not want subsurface. Yeah, yeah. so, you know, um, working with those limitations. So here, once we had this, let me move this out of the way. Uh, at the same time, what I'm doing is, I'm, I'm like kind of moving around really chaotic um right i'm trying to do stuff in zbrush i i'm not sure what i'm doing i don't feel confident and you'll you know if you watch this you'll always hear me you'll get to know eventually that i am very unsure of myself pretty much all, um, most of the time we have imposter syndrome the entire process we, every everything we do we're like okay this is the one where they realize we're total hacks yeah yeah so i'm doing stuff there um, while I'm doing that, I'm trying to figure out the clothing. Uh, and the clothing is going to be created and marvelous, right? Um, part of the challenge what we have with the clothing, and it's a big it's a big deal, is that we also have to make sure uh, that we can simulate the clothing, right? So like in a normal pipeline, um, you just can make something, the model. And then if you're working in a company, you know, however, since it's not your problem, you're going to have an expert class in person. I'm not an expert class in person at all. So my skill sets, I know what I can do and what I can't do. And so since that's the case, uh, I'm going to try to make sure whatever clothing design I come with is something that I can actually simulate with my limited ability. Um, and I also don't want to end up in a situation where the cloth has to be shot modeled, which we'll get to that I'm sure at some point. Yeah. Um, so shot, shot modeling means that you would go essentially frame by frame in in a certain pr program like Chronoscope and adjust the simulation. So like if there's any inner penetration, you would adjust it. Literally, it's almost at that point, it becomes like stop motion. You're going frame by frame and just fixing things. Yeah, you're sculpting over an entire animation. Yeah. And that's actually really, really hard. <laughs> so, And it's time consuming. And, you know, we, this is going to be about five minutes and it can really take a lot of time. So, you know, this is one of the early tests, which I kind of like it. Um, and I'll play this. Let me just make sure this is on loop. And you also see some of this stuff break. Okay, hold on. This loop thing is weird. Sometimes when you press loop, it doesn't loop. 
but if you unclick the loop, it will loop. Uh, also, it's not playing. There we are. So that's one of the early tests, right? Um, and then I did do a lot more tests. So walking is not really that big of a deal, but we will have action. Uh, so we have to do, you know, a stress test where the actions are much bigger. Now, the other thing is you'll probably see some broken files, uh, which is something that I we have to constantly deal with all the time, right? So we'll, let's see. Let me open this one here. So if you see them broken, um, they break after I save the file. And I'm not sure what causes it to break. But it's fun stuff. OK, so here's um, a different clothing design. Right, and it passed the test, but we ended up, you'll see, see some of the stages. We ended up not going with one of the designs. So essentially I, I made two. The first one you saw in ZBrush um, is our main character. This one's the secondary, second ca main character. And let's come back here. Let me just load this one. I seem not to be showing the broken ones. Yeah, I think this is not broken. Let's play. OK, this made it. Let's see if I can pull up one that got messed up, because actually most of them are broken. And for some reason, I'm not pulling up the broken ones. Let's try this one. Um, there's a lot of failed sims, stuff I, I probably should have saved, but I didn't save. Oh, okay, here's a nice broken one. <laughs> so for whatever reason, sometimes after simulating, it just will, will break like this, and this stuff makes me cry. Um, or the other problem that constantly happens is the, the frame rate seems to break. We're, um, if you look in Marvelous, you can set, by default, actually, it wants to do like 30 frames. So if you're looking at the bottom of my screen, it's 24. So I feel like there's some weird stuff going on. But anyway, that's this part here. All right, so um, once I've decided on a style and look at the same time, um, again, the function is a, a really big limitation that we're trying to, to deal with. Um, and you know, that's some of the stuff that is a little bit frustrating for me. Like I know I don't have the test here, but we don't have a uh, thickness on the cloth. Our cloth is thin uh, because the thickness will just kind of break and crumple. And then trying to make sure, you know, how I texture those clothing or what is that thin piece of cloth so that it doesn't look really cheap and weird, um, that type of stuff. OK, so let's just jump into the texturing, some of the texturing stuff. Now I'll show you both characters so you can see, since you're kind of yeah. looking at it. So yeah, so again, keep in mind, like the Cain and Abel thing. So we have our two, our two sisters. Yes, so instead of two brothers, Cain and Abel, we have two sisters. And this is why not? This is super violent, by the way. We're not trying to make a Disney movie by any means. This is, uh, this would be rated a hard R for sure, which we're very proud of. <laughs> okay, so it's trying to load. Just give me a second. Okay, it's loading. Uh, the files get heavy. Um, if I preload them ahead of time, I think it just chokes up my computer. So. Just be patient here. And let's just hit tab. OK. So this is Koa. Yes, this is Koa. It's our main character. Right? Let's spin around the light. Um, that's the one you saw in ZBrush. Right? And I'll show you a breakdown um, once I kind of show you the character. I should probably turn on. It'll look nicer with shadows. There we 
are. Okay, cool. So you can see here, um, the look that we're trying to go for, again, is to try to make it feel like handmade, right? So, you know, what I'm trying to do here is texture it so it looks like the surface is clay. Uh, what quality? They're all 4K. This is actually multiple units. This, I actually like it when there's questions, right? So the body here has four. And Unreal can support UDIMs now, which is amazing. So um, that's not really an issue so much. And if we look here, you can see I have um, it broken up into the clothing, the eyes, the hair, the jewelry, and shoes. OK. Let's come back here. And if we look here, I'm trying to make sure that it actually holds up. Um, some stuff that I was trying to do with the eyes, which hopefully kind of shows up. As you can see how the light is being broken up, right? You can see the eyes look like they're hand painted, which is the point. Like again, yeah. So everything is just dull. hand, yeah, made to look hand painted, right? And it was texturally hand painted. And I don't always um, paint by hand at all. So let me show you just kind of a breakdown. And again, you know, I'm kind of jumping around. It, it might seem disorganized, but that is how I actually kind of worked because, um, again, I'm not certain about the style. I want to move it very quickly into texturing. Um, I feel like, you know, when I'm in ZBrush and I have that part, I'm like, oh, it must be working. But a lot of times that I realize once I start texturing, it, it's not working. So I'm trying to move um, quickly. And then that's why my presentation probably feels sporadic. But let's do a breakdown of the textures. I'm not texturing it live, of course, but you can just see my passes and some of my thought processes. And it's loading. It will speed up. Um, but initially, when you load the software, you can see this bar here. It's it's taking a moment, but once it once it gets there, we'll, we'll be fine. Okay, all right. So here I just have the model, right? Um, I have just a base brown, and there's no texture yet. So the first thing I usually do when I'm texturing is I will just try to break up the surface. So you can see the break up here. Uh, it's very subtle, but I'm just trying to make it feel. Um, a little bit more like clay. So it's just some height breakup. Uh, then I start painting. Now, what's different here is while I'm painting, I actually want to see the brush strokes, right? I want, I want you to see it. So there's a lot of undo, right? Like I would paint something and just hit control Z because it has to be done that one stroke, which, because if you overwork it, it then becomes completely solid. Um, Substance you can get for, for free if you're, a if, student. if you're a student, right? Uh, so it's actually an amazing program. I don't have any recommendations for alternatives, um, but you can get it for free as a student, and they're very easy with that. So anyway, here's some of my passes. And again, um, when I'm painting it, uh, I'm giving a little bit of height just so you can feel like the paint you know, the actual layer of paint. And here's some more breakdowns of layers. I'm just going to turn off the shadows because I think that is slowing stuff down. And some other passes of skin, right? Um, I am thinking, you know, violet around the eyes. Um, you can see my colors. You can see my brush strokes there. And again, a lot of, again, there's a lot of undo. Right, like I hate that stroke that sucked, or you know, I'm constantly thinking that. Um, and then here's the lip layer, and with the lip layer, I tried to make it feel like, you know, lips, right, with the, with the paintbrush strokes, there, and then just some other passes here, just to give it some more breakup. Uh, for the surface, right? So some random dents. Um, that appear somewhere. You can also see in one layer for the skin, I just painted the collarbone, right? So we have knuckles painted in and some, some knee lines. Um, you can see there, 
And then the color correction, it was a little too light here. And then just my paint layer. Right. And again, this was like multiple, uh, multiple strokes to try to make it feel fresh because it's very easy for it to not to feel fresh. So yeah, originally it looked very perfect and it looked better the more un imperfect it looked. Yeah. Yeah. The other thing that is very <coughs> easy for some of the fats is to get lost. So I have some, you know, layers trying to support that. Um, it's very subtle right here with this channel. I just turned on and off. You can see what it's doing is it's kind of scratching up the corners. It's also a little bit more wet, right? So things that help in lighting, I'm always thinking about that. What's going to help in lighting um, is the corner is a little bit more wet and you have to scratch. So that kind of enhances if you're looking right here as I'm moving this around, it's picking up some of the facets because you can actually overpower your, your model with just a texture that doesn't support the model, right? Um, so last layer, right? And then of course the hair here. Um, the hair, you know, uh, looking at the references, we really thought the, the clay look was really cool, right? So just experimenting, playing around with it, um, trying to make it feel like there's clay in there. Um, let's go over here on the hair and this should show some of this. Give it a second to load up. It is still processing. Um, it's actually amazing that it can even do all this stuff. Now the 4K textures, it's uh, with, yeah. With virtual streaming, you could just use yeah um, any resolution, and Unreal is pretty smart about it. Yeah. But we rather work high and then have it scaled down if needed, than work too low and then realize you need it to be higher. Yeah, so that's the base hair. It looks very shiny. So I start just trying to break it up with... Uh, some, that was a response to this question, by the way. Some random kind of stripe stuff. What's neat here, for those of you guys who are interested, um, I don't know if this is too detailed. It's fine. Good. Okay. I don't know if I'm going too detail, getting boring, just trying to figure it out. Um, what I used here was this new projection technique that is late, available in the latest substance, which is warp projection, which is really neat. It takes a little bit to get used to. So if I create a fill, for example, here, right, um, I just have this empty layer. You can see it's white or green. I can load in a map, for example, which is put something obvious like this. Okay, obviously I don't wanna use this. Um, and if I change this to like warp projection, it can be, you, you have all these arrow hairs. You can actually move it to actually fit. Okay, so I can come over here and activate some of these points on the edit vertice, and I can just move, yeah. Essentially latticing it. Yeah, and I can, you know, do whatever stuff. It takes time. You could also add subdivisions and all that stuff. What's also nice is if I come over here, let me just resize this and try to find a different image, I can just drop in something like this, right? So it's very non-destructive. Um, yes, this is the new warp wrap projection thing. So it's it's pretty cool. So that's what I did for the hair. 
Uh, I'm just ruining it with this weird stuff. Okay, let's get out of that. Anyway, so this is some of the hair breakdown, right? And then some of the clothing. Oops, she's naked, <laughs> right here. Um, and then it's just trying to stick with this palette. So it went all kinds of ways um, for this. So yeah. Um, also, you know, some of the things I was trying to do here. Let's show some felt stuff. Let me load up. And this one I can find pretty easy because after not liking this and then realizing this wasn't this this part of design wasn't gonna work, um, I took a break for a couple of days so I can I can tell where I stopped. And uh, you know, as far as how, how long we've been working on this, it's just uh, super new. So we we started Right around Christmas. Yeah, right around Christmas. So you're seeing um, several weeks of work. As soon as we got off break from 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 teaching at Noman, which was December nineteenth or yeah. something, twenty. So just give it a second yeah. while this loads. Okay. So, so this is the sister. So this is the sister, the second character. Right, which I didn't show you the ZBrush file. Um, this is what's the first design in the clothing. And she's got more body paint, um, but she kind of feels, I mean, what's how would you describe it? Just she's more badass. Ultimately, that's what we, we wanted her to be more feminine, more a little bit older, and more, more of the badass hunter of the two. Yes, and we didn't get this vibe from that. Um, so then... I textured it and I kind of finished it and I was like, oh, okay. Oh, okay, okay. You're talking about just the, cl the clothing. Yeah. Okay, okay. Right. So then this is the failed, this is the failed clothing. And we thought, okay, she's too symmetrical. Like, how does that work in her personality? We need to go for um, asymmetrical designs. And, and maybe with her clothing, like, how do you try to tell a story um, visually, right? Like, you know, you might read into it or you might not pick up onto it. But if you pick up on, on it, then that's good. So uh, we decided like, instead of keeping her symmetrical, like in her personality, if she was more asymmetrical, like she's more wild and she's more free. And also um, perhaps because they're hunters, right? Uh, she's wearing more skins. So now this is where if I jump into here, let's open this project, which I think this is neat and this might not be anything to anyone but me. Um, here. Thanks for liking the color palette. That color palette took time. <laughs> so, um, so this is now like the updated costume. So so we thought that one was too symmetrical. Yeah. So this is more, she's a wild woman. Yes. Well, you know, they're like teenagers, but she's. So. For for dealing with skins, so this is actually a skin piece right here, and this is actually a skin piece. You just can't see the textures in here, um, but you can see it right here. So I got a really nice texture of a it's base it's real right it's real crocodile skin um, that has been photo scanned, and and decided instead of trying to make it from scratch, uh, just to trace it like literally right. Now um, you can see like these are, well, the grid's in the way, but these are like the little arms right here. So I actually tried, instead of making it one whole piece, just tried to make it as if it was real in real life. Now, what Marvelous is really good at is if you try, you know, it's it mimics reality, right? So if you understand that and you try to make it as if it was real, it's gonna simulate as if it's real. So since I actually made the arms not as one whole piece, right? So you can see these are multiple pieces. Um, it has a nice hang. So when I, at least I feel when it's simulated that it uh, sim sims like, like a, a pelt, like a pelt, right? And because I trace this, it's going to be really easy to texture. I basically just have to bring the texture in and line up. Uh, I lined it up in the UV. Did you project the crocodiles in subs? Yes. 
So I just lined it right up. So if I open that um, file, which again, will take a second to load because it's a lot of textures. Give me one moment and you'll see the final one. So again, that was a symmetrical one. That was the reject. Yeah, reject one and I painted it and it took me a while. Um, and it wasn't right. And we, like, we both, we wanted it to be right, but we were both like, there's just something. She, she was too similar with the exception of the body paint to the, to the sister. And we wanted there to be a clear distinction personality wise that carried over into the costumes. Yeah. So here's the, here's the final one. Just give it a second. Let's turn off this here. Um, you can see it's asymmetrical, right? Uh, the style is different. If we come back here, I like the back view. You can see the crocodile skin. As far as how I did it, it's just literally because I copied the texture, I traced the actual texture. You just bring it in and you just kind of line it up. Really, really simple. Um, and that's what I did. And so this texture process was super fast, but you know, it's working together with the program and Marvelous um, really careful, right? And then you can see that this skin here and that's the skin here and i think this tells her her side of the story a little bit more that she's Thank you, David. yeah more uh badass and you know where this other girl is not she doesn't have any skins because she's a bad hunter so she this one is the i guess the able she would be like the favorite right she's the badass hunter and then the other one she's not yes so it's not you know, they're not really evil people or evil characters. There's just like with anything conflict and, um, you know, the relationship is, it's not all there. Like a Stephen song, Stephen song. Hey, Stephen. Hey, Steve. <laughs> Thank you. So anyway, um, and then you can see her with her face paint. She's much more fierce, right? The fangs, by the way, the, on the, the, the face paint, those were like an accident. We were like, well, oh, those kind of look like, they kind of look like fangs and then we accentuated them out. Uh, where can I see the movie? There is none. What you are actually watching is our process. You're literally watching so, us make uh, it. Yeah. I have no idea how it's going to turn out and I hope it turns out good. Yeah. Naturally, it would be the worst that we do the streams. In. So yeah, every week we're going to be showing yeah. the process. So we're literally at like, this is the models. Uh, this is the textures. So next week you'll see every Friday at four o'clock, you'll see the progress of it. Yes, and you will see failed stuff. Yeah. So, okay, so that's, you know, pretty much what I have um, for the character stuff, right? A lot of back and forth. Again, um, things working out, things not working out. So we have these two characters, and right now they're in process of being rigged. And, yeah, right. Pass it to me. Yep. Okay, cool. So just give me one second. Just hang on there for one second. Let me just pull this up here. Okay. So. And I don't normally do stylized stuff either. <laughs> okay. So going back to this, um, we knew we had to build the, the well, the hole, the hollow. And this is not what we, we, you know, we were like, okay, we got to make this m cooler than just that, right? It would just not be very cool if the hole just looks like, like this, right? Like, you know, in LA, like there would be someone living there for sure. So we wanted this to be something that was really creepy and uh, felt like, like an ancient evil is what, what I really like, because ultimately if the story is that this, this cave gave out the sound of a crying girl. Well, what attracted the girl to it uh, to begin with, right? So um, let me pull up some stuff here. So we started looking at some of these like ancient um, landmarks, obelisks, uh, um, pl places like uh, Gobeki uh, Tepe in Turkey these like locations that have been found that just have like this magic wonderment to them. Like when you look at that, you're like, yeah, if that's the place where you would summon Satan, like, yeah, I totally would believe it. Right. Like, so we wanted to build our version of something like this, where when you saw, you're like, oh yeah, that's again, that's the same one. Uh, Stonehenge is, is another one that you just see it and you feel like it's 
this is before humanity. It's just this ancient, amazing thing. So um, we wanted to make our, our, our version of this, not just in the hole itself, but in what surrounds it. We wanted to feel like maybe this hole had some sort of a power. Uh, a big a big influence is kind of the, the cartoon heavy metal, like the, the orb that's in heavy metal. That's like, again, like this uh, ancient evil that, that I, I find fascinating. So um, let me close this up. So again, we did what we didn't want was this. So, you know, th there's no evil hole in mega scans at the moment. So we had to come up with something from scratch. And I wanted to learn Gaia for this because it's a program that I've been um, trying to force myself to shift from world machine over to this. So this is just basically uh, the steps we took to get this to look good. So we first started with just a basic uh, crater, which again, it's not very exciting. And we could start doing like a warp on this. So you can see it just shifts the shape from like a circle to a much more natural uh, look. Then we could grab a shape like this and combine them together. And now we start getting something that feels like this. But again, it's not the most exciting thing yet. Okay. So I wanted to make sure, well, for one, when you look at this, there is no hole, right? Like there's an indentation there, but there is no hole. So I needed to get a hole. So I used the mask to just draw a hole in the center here. Let me make sure I have this open just in case. Um, okay. Warp this as well. Blur this. And then when I combine it with this, you can see we start having this hole. But again, it's not very interesting yet. Okay, but at least now it feels like you could fall into this thing. Okay, so you can see the mask just got inverted. It's put in there. Actually, it didn't get inverted. It got inverted for this right here, which is when we started using like the shatter to give it this more chaotic look. So you can see from that to that, it just really starts coming alive. But still not good enough. So some erosion, and it started giving these um, lines that just felt kind of evil to me, which of course, I immediately uh, thought that was pretty cool. We displaced that a little bit more to constantly make the shape feel as organic as possible. Okay, so you can see if we start moving the light around, you can see it's starting to get a creepy little vibe here, okay? Uh, use the carver tool, which is going to just push that stuff in deeper. So you can see we go from that to this. Okay, so now that starts looking like you would not, you would not live there in LA, you would run away from that, <laughs> right? So uh, I started getting some artifacts uh, I, I approach that it's funny because I, I, I teach a, a certain workflow in doing terrains in my look dev class at Gnome. And, and while I was doing this, I kind of stopped doing, list, uh, doing the stuff that I preach in class. And I was like, oh, for this project, I'm going to try something different. And I probably wasted like a week of work and I had to come back and, and like basically take my own look dev class to figure out how to do it right. But uh, these denoise... Um, filters were because I was getting like really crazy uh, spikes in my displacement, which I figured out once I started doing what Miguel teaches in his look dev class. So that's just ignore this one. So another like micro erosion. Okay. And here again, I wanted to push this in further because with all those things, it just started kind of getting a little bit softer. So you could see it's just getting rid of that little section there okay and now we're just putting some more um so you can see i just have i wanted to isolate this area from the rest so we're just blurring that and we're using this shape here and only applying it on the areas outside of the hole that way we go from that to that 
Okay, so I didn't want to distort this anymore because it could start getting a little bit noisy. So again, that's what this mask is for. So only affect the areas out here. So we get that, you can see it looks pretty cool. And the angle that I'm trying to go for is something, I believe it's this right here. Okay. And if it's, it's Michelle. Hey, Michelle. So added some small rocks. You can not see them very well. Yeah, I guess you could see them a little bit over here on the right, on the left. Okay. And lastly, this is where I was doing all my different versions to try to get this right. So I was originally, I was exporting this out just as a high res model because I thought, hey, you know what? I could bring this into, um, into Unreal, just use Nanite, and I don't care about the geometry, which is true, until you have to UV it very high resolution, because here you only have this one map. And I, I wanted to make sure that I had multiple tiles and I could select certain areas and do them at certain resolutions. And that was where everything changed. And I realized, you know what, I can't use this measure. I have to export a displacement map and essentially reapply it onto a plane inside of um, inside of Mudbox, which is what I use. And when I did that, it became an extremely simple process because then I could just grab that plane, UV it as much as I wanted, reproject it. There was a little bit of degradation, but I didn't really care. Uh, and this is when I was doing some tests for coloring, which I ended up just texturing it entirely in substance. But that's it for the whole. So you can see it's a much more interesting um, thing from where we started. So we go from here to here, much cooler, much more messed up looking. And of course, everything is in the lighting. So when you do this, you know, it starts looking pretty cool. So I, I totally love this program. Um, if I were to do something similar in World Machine, I would probably use two, three times as many nodes. So, um, oh, look at Steven. So I'm, I'm, I really love this program. I can't, I can't recommend it enough. Um, really awesome. So brought it into um, Substance Painter. Like, give me one second. Let me pull this up. While what, you're what doing that, on? I'm just trying to look at the, are you going to work, are you guys working more characters? Yeah, there's only two characters, but there are background characters. There's also a father. Um, these two girls are sisters and they have a dad that we haven't done yet. And then um, we have to build a tribe, but we're, we're having them wear masks so that we could um, not go crazy. Yeah, um, with the performance. Which the mask was something that we had we wanted that originally, so it's not like a, a shortcut. It is a shortcut, but it's something we wanted from the beginning. Just give me one second. Let me pull this up. Uh, someone looked at my art station. That's all I have, my art station. Um, everything else is Miguel and I work together. So, yeah. Our art stations are very, um, very, very slim pickings <laughs> we don't we don't yeah. like to show our professional work like our pre uh our our films because we just don't care about that work to be totally honest okay so here it is so brought this in here i'm not going to go through all the layers but uh you can see the one of the things that i wanted and it's in a few of the shorts we've done i just like like black goo uh and i just wanted some sort of like a liquid around the hole that just felt really gross and it was just something you didn't want to get close to so um yeah that was it it was pretty simple and what was what was really cool about this i'll show you the process that i ended up doing um to get this we're gonna get to this guy in a minute which is the tree so what i ended up doing it's just literally creating a polyplane, subdividing it a bunch of times. 
So something like this. And then I would just go uh, sculpt using new operation, select the model, and I would select the displacement map, which I'm not sure which one it is here, but I'll just pull something up. Let me see. See if I could find it. Give me one second. Well, I'm just going to select anything, and uh, it doesn't matter. I'm not. I won't find the exact hole, but you can see I could just run any displacement map on here. So I would just do this with the displacement map that I exported out of there. And then I would just have this on a layer. So again, this is gonna look terrible at the moment, but I could then control the intensity or increase the intensity. And when I did that, I just it just recreated all the exact same levels in here. So let me see if I could just pull this up. Um, and this process is super important because if you just take something that is not prepped. Just give me one second, I'll come right back. Um, prep properly. Um, you will have a very hard time texturing this and you being it, uh, yeah, you will suffer. So, and I've, I've done it, I, I know it, I still do it sometimes because I think I'm gonna save time, but I normally never save time, end up having to redo all that stuff. So you have a clean, proper mesh that you can control the UVs, you can properly texture it, you can get a um, nice resolution on it, and it's manageable. Okay, so here it is. So give me one second, it's opening up. <sighs> and again, like we're gonna be fumbling around like this because we're not, this is not like, hey, we're done, look at what we did. This is us like, hey, you're, we're in the, you're in the trench with us right now. So you can see ultimately all this is, is just a plane. And that allowed me to go back in and re-UV this. So as many tiles as I wanted, I just kept it at four, but I could increase it. And this is what was really cool is I had already textured it with some messed up UVs and all I, it was extremely simple to redo this because all I had to do was just select my shaders here, create a new material, a master material. And then when I loaded up a completely new scene, I was able to just come over here. I probably have it here somewhere like tree, drag it on or, or ground, throw it on there and boom, everything looked essentially the same once I baked out my uh, mesh maps. Uh, I had to redraw some of the areas that were like hand drawn, like some of the masks and some of the art direction of some of the goo stuff, but everything else just landed uh, exactly where I wanted it to land. Okay. So that's that. And then the next thing is, okay, we wanted to create something that, like I said, something that felt like the obelisks or whatever. And that's where I started coming up with some sketches. You know, and, and again, we didn't expect anyone to see this. So we're like, <laughs> this crappy as hell. And obviously you can see from behind me that I am an original trilogy Star Wars fan. So everything is basically a variation of the Starlight pit or something. So uh, early designs were like, hey, this would be like a tree growing out of something that felt like a Starlight pit. Um, don't ask me about Book of Bubba Fett, by the way. Uh, but you could see this was an original idea. And then I got that, the model brought it into uh, Procreate or something and just started drawing like what I wanted this to kind of feel like. And you can see again, like the moon coming through and it feels like a place of ritual. Um, yes. <laughs> um, so you could see we have the moon, we have this, uh, this hand, and one of the things that I wanted with this is that when the sun came came at it from behind, it almost felt like a hand trying to reach for you. And these guys are like the obelisks, but I wanted them to feel like they were, they came from like a real natural thing. It wasn't like something that was man-made. It was like pure 
you know, ancient evil. So uh, that's where brought this into, um, let me just pull this up. Thank you, David. <laughs> See? <laughs> See, far worse sketches. So let me open this up. We have a lot of things open, so um, forgive the delay as we open these files. Okay, so this is, you can see it's pretty close to this design here. And I really tried to keep it, like I wanted every little thing that points out to be in the model. And this is just done in Mudbox using their, is, is essentially like their DynaMesh. So you could just use the Tessellation Master. So I'm still, I do use ZBrush, but for all my sculpting, I rather do it in Mudbox. It just it feels more natural to me. I could start framing the camera here so I could have a proper field of view, proper camera. Uh, it's not, you know, when you, you sculpt in ZBrush, you're sculpting it essentially with a 200 millimeter lens. So here I could change, you know, my camera and I could actually frame exactly what I want. And I started just pulling these vines out, not caring about the topology at all, because I knew that I was going to retopologize everything. Okay. And I knew that I wanted this in silhouette. So really the only thing that mattered to me was that. You know, I just cared about this. And again, it's it's got to feel like a hand, um, an evil hand reaching up. And the moon has to be right in here somewhere. Okay, so a friend of ours from Weta told us um, about this uh, plugin that she's been using, which I, I'm completely in love with this thing, um, called... Uh, quad remesh, right? So it's just like the auto, the Z remesher in, in ZBrush, but it doesn't do spirals. So whenever we were bringing this in, so let me come in here and just bring in something. Um, give me one second. Let me just pull this up. And this, not, this might not be the highest perfect one, but um, it doesn't matter. Let me just bring it in and see. So it's basically um, auto retopology done yeah. really, really good. So this is not the final one, but you could see if I just click on this, I set the poly count. So I went pretty high on it. So let's just go to 20,000. So adaptive quad count so that it would um, change the scale based on the detail areas. And I would just, uh, let me see what else. Hey forum. Hey forum. So I would just run this and, you know, considering it's in Maya, which is not fast at anything but crashing, you're going to see how incredibly quick this thing is going to remesh this thing. Because so that, there you go, completely remesh. Uh, clean, really clean edge loops. And you can see so, when, yeah, when you check this, this is not a spiral. No, and there's no uh, non-manifold geometry, which will catch you at the end. Well, okay, so there isn't, there isn't, but if the points get really close, the mesh, like when I come to these extreme points uh, on the vines, which I don't have here, again, this is not the final model, or like areas like this, it's not the, the, this is not that thin, but the vines got very thin. I did have to go in and clean up a couple of edges, but it was like very, very minor. And again, it was just because the vines were crazy and they were everywhere. So um, again, if you go back to this, this is, there's just vines everywhere. And uh, so it got a little bit confused with like really, really thin ones. Okay. 
So, all right. So let's look at this. Uh, let's look at this all together. So again, this is not the final topology, but it doesn't matter. I did the same thing for um, for these guys here, which I call like the crown, and it's a crown A, B, C, and D. Um, so let's look at this in Unreal so we could get an idea of what this all looks like together. Let me just start closing some stuff here. Just give me one second. So the sketches. Okay. So here, uh, so this is everything together. And you can see um, we have our vines everywhere. So we, we did a, a pass of just vines, sorry, growing out of the hole. Um, the fog carts, you can see we have the moon in the back and all the dead plants. And again, we wanted this to feel like, holy shit, this is, I would never want to be anywhere near there. And this is, you know, where we started, uh, which was very, not that. So we, I felt very happy about this because this is, you know, okay, this is, this is going to be cool. And some of these angles don't hold up here, which I'm going to show you, but it started showing us like, oh, this, this has potential. We would have to redo all the vines and probably uh, for this angle, we would redo the vines and make hero vines and add little thorns or whatever. But you can start getting a feel of like, okay, this thing is going to feel like an evil freaking hole. Um, yeah. So let's just like look around here, which is what's super cool about this is we could just move around the set. Yeah, it still, still um, bugs me out. Yeah. yeah, it still blows me away that you can just put this in here and move around and you don't, you're not waiting 30 minutes or, you know, that's part of typical time for, for something this heavy, right? You would, it would take at least 30 minutes to get one angle and then realize that it sucks. <laughs> yeah. So it, the process is much, much faster. Um, yeah. So let's, uh, let's look at all the, um... The passes here. I mean, I call them passes because I, I breathe like a compositor. But um, so I'm going to move this over here to the side just so you guys can see. Uh, so I'll leave that on. Okay. Okay. So the biggest thing is I, I am a compositor. That is the love of, of my heart. Anybody that's taken my classes will know that that's, I, I think, in terms of f-stops and grain and everything. So the post-process volume for me it was huge. That's where I did my color correction. I, I, I can't think without seeing grain. So there's already like a, a fine grain there. I wouldn't render it this way at the end. But while I'm working, I want to already see it as I, I'm going to see this in Nuke because I do plan on bringing everything back into Nuke. I don't, I don't want it to just be raw renders, but this is as close as, uh, as I can get it to what I, I want it to be like in Nuke. So you can see the post-process volume is changing the temperature. It's getting our crunch in there. Oh, I have my moon. Let me turn that off too. Uh, a little bit of chromatic aberration, which I, Chromatic aberration should always be applied wherever there's a, a bright point and high contrast area, and this is applying it on everything globally. However, I, I, I saw the chromatic aberration more as a softening tool here than as a chromatic aberration tool, like a slight blurring, which is something that I, I we really want to do here. We want a heavy grain on this. We don't want it to look uh, uber sharp. We don't want this to look... Um, yeah, most, Digital. Of our, most of our work is never sharp. Yeah, we want it to look soft. We want it to look grainy. We want it to look crappy in a good way, like in a filmic way. So that's where the post-process volume comes in, and you can see the difference that makes. Uh, the moon is just a card very far away, 
facing us as simple as can be it has a transparency so that you could still see the sky in the back which is cool we have our exponential uh height fog actually this is not the one i ended up using so we'll come back to them um so the spooky trees they're not that spooky when you call them spooky trees <laughs> but, uh the sky is basically you know our our we're doing this with just the regular lighting setup and you could see here you can see how they feel like a hand reaching out the tree there which is something that we wanted to have so if there's a subtle uh light movement it would feel like something calling you in so that's that so that's our sky um and that's all it's pretty incredible i mean coming from a pre-rendered background just being able to do this and seeing the light move in real time just still freaks me out um okay so this is just stuff that's behind camera so okay so mega scans we use mega scans we wanted to use mega scans uh, we, we, you'd be stupid not to use mega scans but we wanted to place it at a, at a distance uh like salt and pepper but we wanted the key pieces to be to be our our creations um so we have some mega scans rocks and, and ground pieces little uh grasses and stuff uh we have a second uh background here and you can see that it's forming this opening here which is what we wanted um all the way back to the original concept the mountains changed but again it's it's got to have that opening it's a stone hedge kind of feel okay the, the the moon comes through this and whatever so the grasses these are all mega scans which are amazing um we have our koa here to be our foreground element so something i always say is you need to have three planes of depth foreground a clear foreground a clear midground and a clear background the foreground is the le the least important in the sense of what it is but it's one of the most important that it's there so it could be anything it could be a tree branch it could be whatever but it's the thing that gets out of the camera right away and it gives you that depth and that parallax which makes it uh so cool okay so that's koa right there um because of the the very strong um post-process volume i needed to have some bounce lights on these uh call them the crowns you can see it's just giving it a little bit of a bounce so it's like a warm bounce light and the last thing which makes all the difference in the world is just these fog cards so all they are is basically just noise on a card you could just move this around and place this wherever and i have them i have so i have materials at different intensities from uh zero to, to full intensity so i could just apply it based on how much uh intensity i want for that um for that one fog card and again the most important thing for me i guess i shouldn't say again because i didn't say this before is just having the silhouettes read super clear and that that would be something that i would be obsessed with in nuke i would be using crypto mats and just placing some sort of a, a fog behind it just to make sure that every silhouette reads clearly so for example here this drives me crazy that the black levels between this branch here and koa are so similar like that drives me nuts even looking at it there should be some sort of uh atmosphere there to break that up are you going to go in details about the render passes uh we will eventually but i don't know i haven't done it yet for them so when we get to that <laughs> point we will but i we still don't even know how we're going to get this into nuke yet so yeah that, that, and that's what this is this is this is not us again we're not pretending we know unreal here this is us like we have no idea what we're doing but we're going to somehow make something awesome we hope and uh so you're literally witnessing us struggle through this so so yeah so that's that and then um yeah and that's it so that's that's that let me just hide that and then the pit cam is just you know we just use that to 
feel like, okay, are you going to feel a sense of danger and wonderment? And we were like, yeah, that, that, that works. Again, we would completely redo all these vines. This should have thorns on them. This is far from what we would want, but we could see this and be like, okay, that looks cool. I would probably want to change the light for this shot because right now everything is just using that one light, but you can see how quickly it is to just move the light around here. Okay. Um, so let me see. Okay. So the other thing, if I look over here, we have a bunch of background mountains that we're going to need for the rest of the environment. So let me just come over here. Um, where's my outliner? There it is. So we know we needed some stuff in the background far away. So you could see that. And the first thing I thought was like, oh, this is going to be easy. All I have to do is grab some mega scans, throw it in the distance, and it'll be fine. Uh, this, is, this is not the final one, by the way, but just so you could see. Um, when we started putting mega scans there, we realized like this piece, it was called massive whatever, turned out being like a tiny little speck. So we're like, oh my God, we need to create a mountain that might not hold up well up close, but can hold up really well uh, from a distance. So that's where we came back into Gaia. And I started creating a series of mountains and I'll just go through a few of them here. So this is one of the later ones I created, but it's one of the ones I like the most. Okay. Let me just minimize some of this stuff so I can see if anybody's saying anything. Okay. Let me minimize Unreal too. So... This was just like a, a slope noise, a fold. Fold is like one of the, the nicest nodes. You could really push this and it just really starts making things look really nice. The carver, you can see like just that would be very difficult to achieve in, in World Machine. World Machine tends to have a certain look. Uh, our erosion just starts really making this thing come to life surface gives it this superficial little breakup little rocks and stuff which i loved some of these nodes are going to take a little bit longer so micro erosion some of these are so little that you might not even notice them and i think that was it for the model side and then we're going to get into the texturing in a second and you can see move the lighting around just looks pretty cool yeah, I think it looks very good. Yeah, it looks pretty cool. And right now we're looking at this at a quarter of the resolution. So we're looking at this with a 1K preview. Uh, we ended up exporting it much higher. So this is low res, which is pretty cool. So from that point on, I had to create the, the texture stuff. And the texture stuff tends to be the things that actually require the most amount of nodes in here. So I'm using the texture node to to generate a breakup. The texture node doesn't really just texture, it creates like this breakup that then is driven by what's called a sat map. So it just looks at these black and white levels and it's basically a remap value where it looks at a black and white ramp, a black to white ramp. And then you could remap that to a, a series of colors. And then wherever that happens to land, light gray, dark, black, white, well, that's one ramp. So in this case, it would look at these white values. It would look at the black values. And then it would look at a ramp of a bunch of brown colors. And then based on where that value is, it would assign a different color. So for example, this here, if we look at this here, ends up becoming something like this. Okay, so let's move this around. And it, it's pretty cool, but it doesn't have enough 
variation. You look at this and you're like, uh, that's not going to work. But again, this, these textures will never work from like a macro level or even like an eye level. It has to be, well, an eye level, it'll work, but background, right? Or aerial uh, shot kind of thing. So we have to do this in layers. So this is kind of like our, our warm, our, our cooler colors. Then we just constantly have all these different, what's called data maps that it generates. And those data maps become masks for other textures. And at the end, you end up with something that looks much more complex. And I don't think this was the most complex of all the textures is pretty simple, but we didn't want it to be insanely busy, but you can see you have all this breakup, you have the sand. Some of them got much more complex. So let me open another one. And I won't run through it, but I'll just show you. Um, I won't go through every note, but I'll show you uh, the final thing. So this kind of became like our hero background mountain. And again, when I mean hero background mountain, we're, we're, we know that this is going to be so far back that you're probably not even going to see it. But what's great is you can knock these out in a couple of minutes. Uh, you know, or if you tried to sculpt this, it would be a very painful process. But if you wanted to, you could run all this stuff into, um, well, that's not it. This is it here. Let me see. Hmm. This might not be the best one to show. Okay. There we go. So this one has a little bit more contrast, but again, you have to remember this is like a distant mountain. And we did add some vegetation, which I ended up getting rid of because um, I wasn't a big fan of it. But you can have it there, and you could also use that to drive some other... Um, like you could have it drive actual trees or whatever inside of uh, Maya, or, or sorry, Unreal. So you can see the lighting again makes all the difference in the world, and that looks pretty cool now. Okay. Last thing um, is we needed like a ground. So let me pull this up. And this was something that we actually were going to have people running around on. I hope this is the right one. Oh yeah, this is it, this is it. You're gonna see this one's pretty simple. Um, just give me one second. It's looking for a file that I probably, uh, I cleaned it up today to make my desktop look nice. <laughs> so let me see what I have here. I think this is it. Yeah, this is it. Okay, so this we wanted the the plane had to line up. So this is the like this is the pathway going up to the evil hole. Just give it a second. Hopefully it's loading. It doesn't seem to like it. If it doesn't do it, um, we'll just I'll just show it to you guys next week. I mean, I'm definitely seeing it, which is what's weird. Let me um, just bring it in from scratch. Yeah, it's not working. For some reason, my map is not, uh, it's not like, so 
It's weird. Okay, so this one I'll have to show another time. That's okay. So Tran has the final model anyway, so she'll show you uh, how it looks once I gave her everything. So let me pass this over to Tran, and you'll see the background mountains and everything. Uh, so Tran, you want to take over? Yes. Okay, so you guys should all see my screen. Um, okay, so what I'm doing here, none of this is actual shots, and they're not frame compositions, right? So if you're looking at it, eh, the composition sucks. Well, yeah, it's not worked out yet. I'm just trying to populate the terrain, try to get a look um, of the environment. Uh, the cave hole has, cave pit area has a, a very distinct look that is very evil, but not everything else in their life in this world is gonna look like that, obviously, right? So um, how does like the regular world look? Um, and that was something challenging. Um, so I just kind of scrubbed through some of the, the you know, keyframes of the camera when you used to look around, just so you can kind of see um, how this environment looks. And it's not complete at all. You know, this is very early. Um, I'm still working on it, right? So, oops, hold on, let me hide. I really should just get rid of these flock cards. Uh, here's another angle here. Let it sit for a little bit. They're moving. It's moving really fast. Okay. Um, here's another angle here. And the floor uh, is all actually the stuff that Miguel generated from Gaia. Um, it has Megascan stuff on top. There's some rocks um, and, the, and the grass and the plant, the small plants. Um, now, if you look here. One of the things I'm working on right now are the trees. So they're not mega scan trees. Um, we did actually try, but to me, I felt you can kind of see the silhouette here. Let me just hide Koa here. Um, I felt like the characters are very stylized, right? They have, I mean, they, they look like they're made out of clay. I have some uh, of these if you wanted to show, or did you want to show them? I can show them okay, in, cool. in, in speech read, okay. right? So I feel like uh, we, we can't just use only like, a, you know, we do want to use Megascan stuff. Stuff looks great. Um, but we do want some shape stylizations, right? So uh, the trees are more much more stylized. Now, as far as like where, what I was trying to look at, let me just pull up some references here. Give me a second. And again, I it's just trying to pull this world together along with the characters. I, I think that the K pit stuff that Miguel was showing, you know, obviously does have stylization. So one of the artists that um we were looking at is Ivan Earl. So like you, you kind of want to set up some rules, right? So in my in our heads, like the rule is that our textural surfaces feel real. So, you know, when I make the character, her she's faceted, but her surface is, is like very clay-like, right? And um, here, if you look at Ivan Earl stuff, these are Sleeping Beauty. Um, you can see like the shapes of these trees are super stylized. So this is, you know, Ivan Earl is the- He's God. Uh, yeah, he's amazing. Yeah. Um, so I'm like, I don't know if I wanna show this, cause it's like really good. <laughs> <laughs> right, but you can see all the stuff here, right? But then the textual stuff feels real. So I felt like by art directing some of the trees, we can kind of use it as a way to marry some of the stuff. Um, it the look is you know based on African landscapes, so there's not a lot really. There's there's a lot of ground, there's a lot of floor, um, there's some grass, and there's really trees. Uh, there's not you know we don't have architecture, we don't have like ruins or any of that type of stuff so to me the trees are huh no i'm just saying thank you to the people that um the trees are really going to help so what i'm trying to do was make these trees again um and hopefully you think it, it works <laughs> but let's just show a few more stuff here um, i'll show you some of the trees here the other goal we have even though this is not really um this is not a shot 
right? It's not a final shot. It's just to try to get everything together and see how it looks. So I did um, basic um, simulation for a cloth and, and the character just to feel like how, how they feel in this world, right? Like how do the colors kind of come together? Um, how do they, you know, do they sit? This is all work. And because for me, you know, that was a, a very, very big concern. Now, the trees have a lot of felled trees. So, um, and some of it seemed like, in hindsight, just really obvious that it was not going to look good. So I don't, you know, but again, I feel like with a lot of coming up with ideas, whether you're, again, writing or you're coming with art, you do have to get your bad stuff out of the way because if you don't know what you're supposed to do, you're just going to start somewhere. Um, most of the time, I, I've heard that sometimes people, you know, the first idea is the best idea. It is never like that for me. My first idea is usually the worst thing that I can make. Um, so let's open, you know, some of the trees here. And what I have open right now is speed tree. So these were made in speed tree. Because it's, um, speed tree is a modeler. It's a procedural modeling program. Um, and here's one of the trees that I made and we did try to place them in an environment. They, they ended up looking like light poles, right? Which was, which was strange. So this was one style. Let me show you a few other styles. Just give me a second. Um, I have a lot of files. Uh, the good thing about one really nice thing about speed tree is their files tend to be really small. So you can save a lot of iterations of it, right? Here's another one, which I don't know, was kind of sloppy um, and muddy before, you know, getting to, you know, understand what it is that, that works. Um, I even went so far at some point, like, let's just copy Ivan Earl because he's really good. So here's one Ivan Earl tree. Right, that's me being kind of lost because I, I feel like this tree is kind of ugly. Um, this one, it's not there. And then um, let's just do this one. And of course it didn't work. Um, it looks like it belongs next to a castle. It's yeah. even has, has fruit, it's got apples. <laughs> okay, uh, that didn't work. And then some of it was just, you know, it's so obvious. I just, I just needed to look at different references. So. If I look at references of um, trees in Africa here, uh, you know, I just need to come back to this kind of shape language, right? They they are um, like, for example, you look at this one or this one. They already look stylized. I don't know why I didn't just go straight to this. They're also very kind of flat at the top. Right, and they're very graphic looking. Like that's a real tree, but it almost looks like it's not real. So it's kind of like the right direction to go in. Um, and again, sometimes things just seem so obvious, but it's it's nothing is ever obvious until you work it out, until you actually finish it. Then you go, oh, okay, that was obvious, but you don't know that until you you get there. Um, and you know, I usually end up feeling kind of stupid. I mean, why didn't I know that the first time? We really wanted those Ivan Earl trees to work like that. Yeah, the topiary uh, they actually ones. look kind of cool, but not not for this. So here's one one tree. Um, so again, the textures are from Mega Scans, right? And then the leaves are Mega Scan leaves, and you can pop out. You can make so many trees. Once you make one tree, you can create variations really really easily. Um, the way I you know, I'm not going in depth into this. Maybe we can do another stream um, because that's like a whole thing about that, how how they were constructed. There's forces, um, gravity and stuff involved to try to make sure that these bend at a certain angle. Yeah, they do kind of look like um, bonsai trees. I agree. Um, so we'll maybe come into that another time. But the way I broke this up is before bringing it to Unreal, I broke into three sections. One is the leaves, 
uh, because, you know, I, leaves have opacities. Um, the other thing is some of the bigger forms. Like if you look here, you know, you can see my speech tree node graph, right? And um, the bottom ones are the bigger forms, and then it goes breaks down to smaller branches. So I have my bigger forms broken away from my smaller branches um, for two reasons. One, um, if you're looking at this, you can see the tree here really doesn't have, um, you're seeing the detail of the texture, but hold on. I can't use a tablet in this program. Let me just drop on a blank material here so you can actually see what the model looks like. Um, there is not really a nice surface detail, right? Like you, you do want, at least I want that to be more sculpted. So that part I bring into ZBrush and displace it. And the smaller tree branches don't really need it. And also part of the reason is like, if you look at a scene, we don't have wind. I don't think we will have wind. But I do kind of want to. We might, yeah. We might plan for it. So if for, I for a particular shot, for yeah, yeah. Um, if I take the big forms and I bring them into ZBrush and displace it, uh, the wind will no longer work from SpeedTree, right? SpeedTree can generate wind, um, but if I only apply wind to the small branches, um, then it's not a problem. So my big trunks or the main trunk part will be static and then small uh, leaves and the branches can have wind. So, you know, this is not a tutorial. I'm just gonna apply some kind of wind just so you can see. Okay, now if you look here in my graph, you can see I have um, these numbers, one, two, three. Um, here you have, I have a slider, which you can kind of see over here, right? So the control, the intensity of the wind. But if I come back here, I click on the fan, to enable this wind here. Um, I have level one and two, so I can actually disable the wind, say at level one and two, right here, where I'm gonna displace um, ZBrush stuff. And then from three and four up, right, I can have wind uh, if I come back and we decide, well, we do need some kind of wind. Yes, I am thinking about how trees will look illuminated. I'm very nervous about that because I know that we know that foliage has issues. Yeah. Um, so but those tests we showed are in Lumen already. Yeah, they all they yeah. seem okay, and I think it's because there's not like a ton of trees, and there's the grass is just not really a lot of grass, so it seems like it's working out. But yeah. that is absolutely a concern. Um, but if we don't have any grass or any trees, I don't know. You know, everything would just. Yeah, I'm not sure. Like we would, I think we need it to feel. Yeah. yeah. We're also, I don't know, going to make up special grass or, or something like that. Um, but anyway, so I'll just show some other stuff here. Give me one second. Um, I basically export this into three sections, again, within mine, possibly applying wind simulation to the small stuff. Um, I bring this into ZBrush. Give it a second. Here it is, right? And, you know, it looks really weird without the other stuff, but I displace it. So now I have something uh, much nicer, okay? Um, little things that I do, if we go back into speech tree here. Let me just hide some of this. Actually, before I go into the little things, I'm probably going to break this by doing this. Um, there's a lot of different ways you can approach making a tree um, in speed tree. So whatever I show you, you might think it's not right or, or whatever. Um, but, you know, this works for me. And I try to keep it very procedural. You can draw a tree in speed tree, but... 
uh, if you draw a tree, you cannot randomize it. So I can come over here and go to where it says random seed. And I can just randomize some of this, right? Um, and you can see I have a different tree. And sometimes it sometimes it looks terrible. Um, and sometimes it looks good. Let's open one, but that one's actually particularly special. Let's try B or A. I think A is usually the most generic one. So I name my trees A, B, C. And my first one is usually the most simple one. Okay. So I have one here. And I'm gonna come back. Um, I can try randomizing my trunk. Right, it gives me something different. Um, I can come into this one here. Uh, these are called generators, these nodes. And I can randomize, um, hit random, and I'll get something different. Right now, part of my tree Ben here is actually um, being controlled by these forces. So these planar forces are these planes here, um, and they are actually bending my tree trunk. So if I come here, let's see, I have plane one and two. They're doing slightly different things, and I rotate this. It's going to have a delay. Actually, let's hide this. Normally, you can't do this with all this visible. So I'm just going to hide all that. And let's hide this. And so you can see what's happening. So this force is changing the way my tree is bending, right? Um, and again, this is not super in-depth because I think I would need more time to get into that. But I can do something like that. And then this one is also kind of, you know, influencing it in certain ways. Right, so I can change that. And let's just show some of these branches. Here, let's hide this one. Uh, these ones are don't have much gravity on them. They're just kind of doing their own thing. And then these ones here are being influenced by some of the direction, right? So you can see it's forcibly um, making it bend at a certain angle. They look kind of ugly when you don't have the leaves. <laughs> okay, uh, but let's just say some one here. focus on that. So I'm just narrowing these down. So we can kind of see. So it's not um, super hard to get a tree to bend 90 degrees. If we look here, I have a direction, I have multiple directions. Um, direction one is probably this one here. And what it's doing is forcing it to move up. Right, so he, that's how this one looks without any kind of direction, right? It's just slanted. Now, when I turn it on, I can control where that tree is going to bend. Let's just lock this here. Um, so you have a strength here, right? So it's at one. You can exceed one, but generally it's zero to one. Um, I can turn it off by setting it at zero or I can change the strength, but let's just leave it at one so it's maximum strength. And then what this graph is, is controls the root and the tip behavior of the tree. So right now it's saying uh, my root is not being influenced, right? So that's why if you're looking, which this icon is kind of in the way, so it's kind of annoying. Um, but if you're looking at it, you can see down here, it doesn't bend, it's behaving normal. And I can change this by moving this up um, and you can see how that changes that. And if I kind of relax this a little bit, I keep losing my graph, um, it's a softer bend. But if I do this, you can see the 
it's much sharper, right? Um, and then, of course, this is not just one branch. It is growing off of, you know, multiple generators there. So anyway. It's, it's fairly fast, Seagull Rush. Yeah. It is. To fairly me. fast, not very fast, fairly fast. Cool. OK, fairly fast. Uh, how pro yep, how process have you so we can Probably do like questions. Yeah. Unless you have a. Do you want to? Is how much more stuff did you want to show? Well, I can. You know, we can do. I'm probably gonna end up making a lot of trees, <laughs> like in yeah. the future. Yeah. Um, but I yeah. would just show it all together one more time. Yeah. So let's just check it out, here. Hmm. And. Let me just jump back. So this is this is all in Lumen. Yes, uh, and we did do render tests, and it's, I think it will be fine, but we'll we'll see, right? Um, okay, there's some of that noise there on the grass, and let's just jump back here. Again, these are not final shots, but we're just getting a look at the environment. At the end over here is where. Um, the we'll, hole is yeah we're the and we don't have the transition so it's just it's completely empty you can see the spooky tree up there yeah that's a spooky tree <laughs> uh another angle that we have right and then this other angle um things i want to do i don't know just keep improving maybe the fall off um this is a big mountain that Miguel built over here. Yeah, Guy is basically everywhere there. It's yeah, just it's, hidden. It's right here. We're not flashing it like on and on. You know, we're, we're, we're keeping it under stuff. Yeah, and the ground is all in Gaia. Yeah. Um, right. And let's just jump over here. Play our... Unreal is amazing. Yeah, it really is. Yeah. Like that, the fact that that's just playing is pretty crazy. Yeah. So again, these aren't shots, but these are these are the two where we, you know, we're seeing them come to life, and we were like, oh, that's kind of cool. Uh, could we make a tree likeness by reference? Sure, but that we could totally do that. But that's not. I mean, I think if you really wanted to. Um, to just have a completely real tree. You could model it, but you could also just use some of the presets, but uh, we wanted it to feel more fantastical. Yeah, more stylized to fit. Um, if I wanted, wanted a real tree, there's, you could probably buy a tree from Speed Tree. The Megascan trees are great, actually. Yeah, you have the Megascan trees. Um, definitely not making the stylized tree because it's fun. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's just more to just kind of get um, you know, I don't want like from, you know, I don't want the only thing stylized to just be the character. There needs to be some kind of change in, in the way that yeah. something else looks like the environment. Right. Yeah. And the village. So now we have to build the village, um, that we're not going to get into today because we, we started doing some, uh, some stuff in particular, like a, I'll show you like a quick teaser of what we're going to talk about next week, but it's we're very early on this. Um, Can I share your screen? Yeah, share oh. here. But we, we wanted to build these huts and we did a few quick ideas of what these huts are going to look like. And right now they're just, you know, they're, they're like lined up or whatever. They're not very interesting, but we started grooming these all in X Gen, and seeing can we bring this into Unreal and get it to look like this. And the answer is we got it to look pretty good, but we'll, we'll talk about this stuff next week. Um, we'll actually have much more than this because that's going to be the focus of this week for us. Is just getting uh, getting this all looking pretty good. But I'll show you like a quick. Uh, let me pull the, give me one second. Let me just find this.
And again, this is like beyond rough at the moment, but it's just showing that. Um, You're not sharing your camera. Yeah, I know, I know. Oh, intentionally awesome. not sharing. Okay, is that is that live? So this no, it's is not just live. put it. Okay, I'll turn it on for you. Yeah, so this is just seeing like, can we get this stuff to to render correctly in um, in action? Like this feeling, not action. What am I saying? In Unreal. So this is not texture. This is just like raw geometry, and you can see that there's still like you could see geometry underneath, but. Um, we wanted to see if we could get this to feel like actual hay. And the village is gonna be very vast, but again, this is just like, will this process work? And we actually had a lot of issues with this because um, we started getting a lot of noise. And at the end, you can see we got it looking pretty good, but it's still something that we're, we're definitely uh, refining and we have to figure out how are we going to texture this so that there's variation and breakup in all of this and you know having hundreds of these things all over the place so they're all geometry right we convert yeah this it. is what this is 100 percent yes geo. so the action stuff converted into geometry so you could literally just come over here oh, i have it here and we would literally just go to um, and you could see that this is literally what we were bringing in. The problem, though, is that all of this has one single UV, which is what you would want in a pre-rendered world where you're like, oh, there's just one texture for all the, the, the hay, super easy. But we had to figure out a workflow. So we had to do like UVs and, and auto UV it in a way so that it would not do that. And it's nothing difficult, but that's where we're at right now. So we're building this village uh, and figuring out all the hay and, and the, the look of it because we're not sure exactly what we want this to look like. Originally, we were like, let's make this thing look incredible and it'll be huge and gigantic and it'll be super magical looking but it didn't fit with the hunter gather thing that we wanted. So we wanted it to feel beautiful, majestic and, you know, full of wonderment, but it felt like this is, they're there for a year, six months, and then they're moving on. It couldn't feel like, I'll show you like some of the early ideas. We were like, let's make it like on some big thing, which again, you can see the star Wars cloud city <laughs> reference. I'm not ashamed. And you could see, uh, we were like, let's make it look like it's all built out of wood and ropes and whatever. And that we were like, this is silly. Let's just make it smaller and more intimate, which is what the story is about anyway. So anyway, that's what we'll talk about next week. Uh, do you guys have any questions for us? Let me put this back to. If anybody has questions, now is the time. So thank you. I'm not thinking of it again. Okay. Well, thank you guys for, thank you, Alex. Well, congrats on, ep oh, okay, this episode one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because we do want to do more of these shorts. So this would be the first one, uh, of at least two that we're going to do. So that's our episode one as well. So, okay. Well, okay. Well, thank you guys so much, Michael. Yes. Um, I do like getting questions. So yeah, cool. So we'll see you guys. Anybody that's uh, still interested, just will be here next, next Friday at four o'clock. Uh, Again, we did have a month uh, head start here. So every week is not going to have, you know, two characters, two gigantic environments done. But uh, hopefully we'll have uh, some cool stuff along the way. And we'll get into stuff that a lot of people don't talk about. Like we're going to do the casting 
uh, motion capture, all of that stuff, which we hope to show every, every single step of the way. Okay. Yeah, that's one month. So almost a month to the day because the term ended Heining, well, you came and gave us donuts right around this time a month ago. So <laughs> you know exactly when. So, yeah. So, yeah. All right. Hey, Michelle. So, um, it's nice to see you guys in here. So, yeah. Forum. What is the Michelle. tree thing in Unreal called? Uh, speed tree? You mean the program used to build the tree? That's speed, speed tree, if that's the question. Yeah, it's not part of Unreal. That's just a, a custom tree builder. But you could use the Mega Scan trees, which they are really amazing. Yeah, they're super great. Um, I I don't think I can do better than a real tree. It's again just building what we we have to build. Thank you, Devin. Yes, good so, to have you guys in here. So, all right, that's all right. Okay. So let me. Uh, Press this cool video. I will see you guys next week. Thanks, everybody. And thanks to Noman for letting us do this. And Alex, who's always been uh, our biggest supporter and patron to everything we've done. So we're very uh, honored to do this and, and thankful for your support. So, yes, thank you. Thank you, guys. Bye bye. Bye.